What's going on guys? It's Chad. Welcome back to the Easy Astro Images channel. As you can see right here, the Rasa came back from Celestron today. And luck be have it, we are going to have a clear night out tonight. So I have feverishly been installing all my old gear, rails, and all that kind of stuff back on to the Rasa so we can get it all prepped and ready to go for everything tonight. So I'm pretty much at the point now where we're ready to start installing the Octopi. So had a really good discussion on the Rasa Facebook group. I'm going to put a link to that post down in the description below so you can take a look at that. Keith, the maker of this, chimed in with a lot of great information and so did everybody else. So it's greatly appreciated. Should make this process go a little bit smoother. Obviously, I have a lot more things to do tonight like focus the guide scope, make sure everything connects and works and all that kind of stuff. So I will sort through all of that stuff and we'll be bouncing back and forth between here and the bench and day and night. So why even get the Octopi adapter? First of all, look at this. This looks collimated, right? It's not. If you put center concentric circles up, it is way out of collimation. Here's a wide angle shot of all of my corners. I'll show you guys these close up every single corner, no matter what filter adapter spacer combination I use different cameras. I got stars that did everything. They had minds of their own in every corner, not like the usual back focus type of diagrams. Some of us like are familiar with this chart here on the right. And this is typically what you would see. I see this with my refractor when I have to change my back focus on it slightly. But my cameras never did this on the Rasa. Last night they did though with the Octopi adapter. See how everything kind of has like a similar pattern as you go around the chip? Really plain to see whether you are too close or too far away. You will see that on the video here. I did not see that on mine. Some corners that were supposed to go this way went that way and everything else as you saw. That's why I sent it to Celestron, make sure everything was all good before we get the Octopi adapter and get everything installed. So the first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to put the bottom piece of the Octopi adapter on to the Rasa and just kind of find out where it sits. And it's pretty cool how it all threads. It is basically like everything just kind of sits right in there. So this is basically so I can get the orientation of my camera correct. I just want it to be in the normal orientation. You know, there's no way to change rotation angle or nothing on this. Once you have it all installed, unless you pretty much take it apart from what I can tell. So what I've done is just taken a piece of tape and I've marked the actual bottom part of the Octopi uh, space adapter and then this inner part here, which is what is going to connect the camera. So I know that is basically the bottom right there. So when we secure the camera on the inside, it'll all be perfectly aligned and, you know, this will be like right side up. All right. So here you can see that I have the adapter and the camera together exactly how I want to do. So when this all slides in together into the base, we're gonna be in the correct orientation that I wanted. Now let's go ahead and take a look at this Facebook post and see how we need to proceed from here. There's some good info here. And Keith is gonna chime in here, who's the maker of all this stuff. And he basically explains to us what kind of measurement and focus that we're going to be looking for um, information like that. That's pretty important aligning up a couple of the pieces together that he is, you know, since it's machined as one part, he's got some witness marks on there for us to take a look at. Um, there's a couple pictures on here that were added to help measure your back focus for your starting point a little bit better. And that's pretty much where we're going to start. And it, we're going to go off of, so we're going to measure from the base of the camera here to the very top here at, he says, 28.73. And then we are going to 
So since we actually took the plate off of our camera, we're actually gonna be looking for about 16.23 millimeters, plus or minus about a third the thickness of a filter. And we're gonna get that measurement by using our calipers and doing this. And then on the flip side, when we're done, then we can flip it over and we can measure the length of the actual screws. And that should help us dial things in a little bit closer. So it's really great to have these measurements and all of that kind of stuff. So what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and switch to the bench view here and we'll get everything assembled and we'll take a few initial measurements. All right, so we got all of the pieces together here. Everything is mounted up. This is as flat and together as I could get it. Let's go ahead and match all of this up here. So this is gonna be my bottom. Here is my next piece that will go on top of this. Now, right next to this screw hole right here, you're gonna see there is a little punch right there. And that little punch needs to match up with that punch right there. So that is our witness mark. So when everything goes back together, it's basically gonna go like that right there. So that is awesome. So what I'm gonna do is just put the camera in there. We can get rid of the tape here. And now my camera is where I want it. And then make sure we're lined up with the witness mark. And this will all just kind of slide right through here. Boom. And now we're going to uh, screw everything together here and then we'll flip it over and start taking some measurements. All right, so everything is together here as you can see. And we are gonna have this baby flipped over here. And let's actually turn on the calipers here. And we'll go ahead and get our first adjustment. So we'll zero this out. And this is gonna be obviously difficult for you to see. All right, so measuring from the camera to the top part where the threads start, Right now we're at about 14.4 millimeters. So we've got a little bit of adjustment to make. So we're gonna have to crank these out a little bit to get closer to that 16.3. So I decided to start with 16.5 millimeters of distance there on the bottom. Keith said 16.32 plus whatever, a third of your filter thickness. And I couldn't imagine that I would end up where I'm at right now. Now, keep in mind, this system is not perfect yet. I still have some work to do, you'll see that. But I was able to achieve really good results uh, in the night. It took a little bit longer than I thought. Most of the problem was based on my measuring tools. Now, a lot of people, including Keith and Doug, have recommended calipers. The problem with calipers is that they are hard to get the same measurement twice. You know, when you are like out there in the cold and you're trying to keep them straight from every angle, it can vary quite a bit. So what I have found that I'm gonna try the next time out is an actual feeler gauge, which the feeler gauge, you know, is something like this right here. And this has, incremental measurements on this and this will help get me a lot closer as far as what distance they are i can kind of verify the screws with the caliper themselves because now that we have a back focus distance roughly we can fine tune everything with this and then upload the videos to CCD inspector or whatever and see how close we are my current distance after doing all of the work last night actually ended up being around 17.25 to 17.5 millimeters in distance. And if I flip things around and measure the short fat screws on the front side of the camera, I'm looking at screw number one at a total height of 9.16 millimeters, screw number two of 9.05, and number three at 8.9. Now that was my last adjustment at about 2.30 in the morning. So that's why things are a little off and I can kind of verify what's going on with that 
when I look at the actual images. I can see that one side is, you know, definitely slanted a little bit more. The one downside to the Octopi, I've seen that Keith did this on the Ross 11 adapter, is that he's got four adjustments points. So for each corner of your sensor, I'm sure it, it's like a size limitation because he would have had to increase the size of the actual device itself. Boy, it would have been nice to have that on this Ross 8 adapter. That would just be the money shot right there because when you have to adjust two to move one corner, that's where things get a little bit hairy. And we really haven't got to that point yet. So this is an old image here of just showing what uh, things used to look like. And looking at this, everything was not too bad except, you know, to me, it just wasn't uh, wasn't acceptable. So here we are with our first image tonight, and you can see that uh, tilt. We're looking at uh, you know a pretty big tilt here, and our off-axis aberration is a 1.33. So it's actually a little bit worse right now. So that's uh, according to Keith. What we need to do is work on back focus first before we work on tilt, but we obviously can see that we've got some tilt issues because we've got bigger stars up here in this corner. We've got small ones here, small ones here, and they're not too bad here. So we've got like kind of a odd tilt angle going on. If we look at Nina, well, we're not gonna be able to because we're defocused, but I was looking at the stars in the aberration inspector and they are a lot different compared to what they used to be in my images before. So what we're going to do is start making some adjustments. So we're basically going to, I believe, looking at the ass tap here, we're going to try to pull all of them out and mainly focus on these two corners here and uh, just see what, uh, what we get. So the end goal guys is something like this right here. This is actually the diagram from my Radiant Raptor 61 and everything just threads together really nicely and there's no slop or anything like that. If you want to change back focus, you can just simply insert any thickness of like M48 spacer into it to increase or decrease. You know, I have a curvature of 22% like barely any tilt at all. It's a perfect frame. Now, when I change filters, the filters actually will shift this stuff around a little bit. So you gotta be really careful. You almost have to tune for your filter as well. But this is the end goal. All right, so we're making little tweaks at a time. What I'm basically doing is I'm backing off the long screws and then going in on the short screws so we can increase the back focus. And I pretty much got a little bit of a system down here. What I've noticed is that each time I need to up my autofocus position about 75 to 100 steps, and then I'll redo an autofocus routine, take an image, and then we'll open that up in ass tap. So it's a pretty good system that I got going on. Very important that. As soon as you get everything on and you find a good focus to start with, get your focus calibrated, your step size and everything like that. So you can get, you know, a nice focusing curve like this every time makes things super easy. So what we'll do now is we're just going to go into just, I just got a 10 second regular sequence going on and I'm just going to run the picture. This is where we were at last time. Um, tilt you know we're not really worried about right now but we're at a 0.85 so we're trying to get that number down as low as possible to achieve our back focus so we just took that image there and we're going to go back into as tap and scroll down and load and you can see how many iterations i've done here not using any calipers or anything like that just kind of trying to eyeball it Probably taking a little bit longer. I'm not sure how well the calipers are, like how useful they are after you get to this point right here. Um, let's see where we're at right now. So we were at like a 0.85. And so we're at a 0.81. The tilt got a little bit worse. It would be so handy if this device had 
four screws instead of three. So that way we could adjust each corner. So we're going to go back out and make a couple new adjustments. And that's just basically the process right there. Just going to keep doing what I'm doing, pushing the whole thing in and watching that uh, off axis aberration number drop down. And what I had failed to realize was I actually was moving the camera sensor away from everything and I keep and I needed to go closer. Thank goodness for that chart that I showed you earlier. So after backing everything out, I went all the way back in and kind of started over again. And that's where I ended up at last night when I finally just called it with the final image that you'll see here and then proceeded on to try to get some images out of this baby before the clouds came in. So what we're looking at is me at 2.30 in the morning. What a long night that was. If I didn't have to put everything together and I had to switch out autofocusers, I probably would have only had about two and a half hours into actually tuning this. Uh, but this was where I was happy with for the night. So I just slewed to the target, did an autofocus run, guiding's running, a few things we're gonna change on the Rasa setup. We'll talk about that in another video upcoming. And you can see that we are taking our first image here. And I just wanted to stay away from the moon and try to capture something with a decent amount of stars. But the clouds started rolling, as you see. Just went ahead and slewed over to Bode's Galaxy. Of course, with the Rasa, we picked up the cigar and a bunch of other stuff, which is just so awesome to have the F2 back. And you take a look here at everything on the Aberration Inspector. You'll see that the right corner and the bottom right corner are not too bad. Uh, the other corners were passable. Everything is definitely better than it was. Now I can tell that I'm looking at a tilt issue unless somebody tells me that I need to be looking elsewhere by going in or going out. So we'll take a look at the CCD inspector uh, graphs here real quick because I know those are more familiar to some people than ASTAP are. And we'll kind of show you where we're at based off of the images that we ended with for the night. But yeah, we were able to actually uh, grab some images. It's nothing worth stacking or anything like that at all. So it just kind of is what it is. And just kind of, again, just looking around at the stars, seeing what's going on and uh, just kind of taking a deep breath that, hey, I think we made some uh, pretty good progress here. So here's what we're looking at like right now in CCD Inspector a 32.6% curvature on this graph right here. I've tried messing around with this before. Like when you look at this right here, it looks like obviously we could tell this side is higher than this side. And it looks like we're pushed in a little too much in the middle. But if you try to back things out, it does, it just seems to never invert that. So that's kind of the, the funny part about the whole thing. If we look at the actual uh, uh, curvature and not the 3D plot of everything, I'll show you that. You can kind of see where we're at again. Uh, tilt, 15%, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's where we're at. So that is going to do it for part two of this video series, guys. In part three, hopefully we will have all of this said and done and everything will just be beautiful. Hopefully we'll get some great feedback from everybody. Thank you again for all that. And thank you to all 30 some of you that are subscribed to the channel. If you like what you're, I'm doing here and you want to see more, of course, like and subscribe. And we will be back with part three. I'm going to get to work actually right now with this feeler gauge and kind of line everything up so we have a good base starting point again. And we'll just keep rocking and rolling until we get this baby ready to go. So thanks a lot, guys. Peace.